Open your Bibles up to the fourth chapter of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 4, we'll be looking at verses 30 to 32 this morning. This is, Lord willing, the final sermon from this chapter of the book. Not the final sermon on the book by a long shot, but this is the final sermon on this important chapter of the book. When Paul, here in this chapter, gives very significant instructions on how to live out the reality of our life together as a community of believers, as a family of God. Last week, we were looking at just verse 29, and uh, we entitled that message last week, Developing a Spiritual Gag Reflex. And, And we saw there in verse 29 that Paul would have us with regard to our thoughts and our words, gag before we would open our mouths and speak unwholesome words that would tear down the body of Christ, that we are to build up the body of Christ. Here in verses 39, or excuse me, 30 through 32 this morning that we're looking at, we continue basically to be looking at the tongue. So it is a related aspect, but it is still fundamentally looking with regard to the tongue, and I've entitled the message this morning, The Relational Death Spiral. The Relational Death Spiral. I've been very inspired, by the way, the last few weeks with my titles. I hope you've been inspired with them well, as well, because normally I'm sort of like one title, part one, two, three, four, five. You know, my grandson said, Grampy, you had nine parts to one sermon, and I said, I know it was a long one, wasn't it? So I've been feeling really good these last few weeks with these titles, and so here it is, Escaping the Relational Death Spiral. Okay, not Death Star, but Death Spiral. And there is a connection here that I want you to see between Paul's instructions in verses 31 and 32 and the wholesome words that he speaks about, or the unwholesome words that he speaks about in verse 29, and the connecting link is the very profound theological statement that he makes in verse 30 with regard to grieving the Holy Spirit of God. It is the link that ties this whole section together with regard to the use of the tongue. So we'll look at that, and it's a significant uh, aspect. So let's just do this as we're getting started here. Maybe ask a question, ask an answer. What is a death spiral? Since it's part of our title, we have to escape it. We ought to know what it is. So what is a death spiral? Well, a death spiral... Uh, originally was a reference to a, to a downward spiral taken by an aircraft that is out of control. You know, you've seen it, They're just sort of spinning and heading towards uh, catastrophe. That is a death spiral. That terminology, that idea has been, been uh, used to, in other fields. It's been used in the fields of finance. It's been used in the, in the fields of insurance, for example, talking about a death spiral spiral of health insurance exchanges and and those kinds of things. But what I want to do with it this morning is I want to apply it to the realm of relationships. I I want to apply the concept of a death spiral to the realm of relationships, and in particular, relationships within the community of believers. Okay, so you kind of keep in the back of your mind a death spiral and how we're going to escape it. Because once a community of believers gets, gets trapped in this death spiral, it brings no end of death and destruction to a local congregation. And it can begin with just one person. And it begins to fan out from there until it overtakes a congregation and can bring about all kinds of destruction. So here we are this morning. We're looking at verses 30 to 32 And what we're going to see in the text here are three prohibitions, three prohibitions that we must heed in order to prevent a relational death spiral from occurring here at Foothill among the people of God. So three prohibitions that we have to hear and heed that we might prevent one, a relational death spiral from occurring among the body of believers here. So the first prohibition is is found here in verse 30, and it is simply this, grieve not the Spirit. Grieve not the Spirit. Verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, 
by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This command and the underlying truth of this command is really what separates Christian ethics from all other religious or secular ethical systems. This is the underpinning that, that lies under all of the, of the commands about how we are to live and treat one another. It, it's summed up or, and then built upon this incredible reality. It is, it is the essence, we could say, of the new and renewed mind. The new way of thinking is built upon this reality, and this reality strengthens us as we begin to understand it and as we begin to think about it, this profound reality that we are to grieve not the Spirit of God who seals us for the day of redemption. This profound truth enables you and I to live beyond above the natural realm of this world. It allows us to have a, a supernatural ethic and to live it out. So let's kind of peer into this a little bit here in verse 30 and try to understand what is Paul saying. What is Paul saying here when he says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Fundamentally, what Paul is saying is that as a, as a child of God this morning, if you, are, if you are united to Christ by faith, a child of God, an adopted son of the Father, then you are in relationship with the Holy Spirit of God. You're in a relationship with the Holy Spirit of God. And He is a person. You are in relationship with a person, and that person is the second person of the tri or excuse me, the third person of the triune Godhead, the very Holy Spirit of God Himself. And it is He, Paul tells us here, verse 30, who seals us. In other words, who secures us, who authenticates us as the Father's adopted sons. For example, back in chapter 1 and verse 13, you you see Paul's earlier reference to this same reality, where he writes in chapter 1, and verse 13, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. We have been sealed with the person of the Spirit. In other words, we have been brought into a relationship with the Spirit of God in which He dwells within us that assures us, that authenticates us, that establishes the reality that we are the children of God. He is the very seal of our redemption. And this seal provides you and I this morning with, as one author says, the security and assurance that God will fulfill his promise of redemption. Look at it again. You were sealed for the day of redemption. In other words, you have been sealed by the Spirit of God to be ensured that you, when the day of redemption arrives, when Christ returns for his church, he will catch you up along with all the other believers. You won't miss out. Because God has set his seal upon us, we can be sure he will never let us go. That, my friends, is a very important and profound truth upon which to build our Christian ethic. We can bring pain into the relationship for sure. Paul says here that we can bring relationship, or excuse me, grief into the relationship by grieving God's very Holy Spirit. But even though we bring grief, we cannot sever what God has done. If you are a child of God this morning, you have been authenticated by God himself as his spirit has been set upon you and in you. Now let's talk a little bit about this grieving. Grieve not the spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. What does it mean to grieve? This is a relational term, by the way. To grieve is to, is to disappoint another party. It is to sadden someone. It is, to, it is to hurt relationally someone. 
And what Paul is saying here is that as Christians, we are in a personal relationship with God in which God himself in the person of his spirit resides with us and in us. And mysteriously, Paul tells us that, that we can bring pain to that relationship. We can bring pain to that relationship. We can cause God to grieve in the midst of that relationship. That's mysterious, to be sure. That is mysterious, to be sure. But this is the reality of relationships, is it not? This is the fundamental reality of, of relationships. We only care about those that have the ability to hurt us, if you really think about it. The fact that somebody can hurt you in a relationship is a sign that you care about them. That you care about them. And that's true here with the Spirit of God. He deeply cares about you. He deeply cares about you. And the reality of that means is that how you and I respond to him, how we live out our life before him and with each other can bring pain to that relationship can grieve the very heart of God. How? How do we grieve the Spirit of God? Well, look again at the context here. We have to first see that we grieve him by our words. We grieve him by our words. Unwholesome words. Down to verse 31, bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander. We'll look at those in more detail here shortly. But it is the use of our words that brings grief to the heart of God. We can also grieve him by our actions as you, as you just let your eyes go further backwards into the passage. Where we are lying, the, the, you know, the lying to one another or, or, or the, the unrighteous anger uh, or the, the, the stealing and all of these kinds of deeds. And as we roll into chapter 5 and, and where Paul will talk about our sexuality and, and how we conduct ourselves in a world that is that is uh, evil in, in so many ways, these, these, these actions of a believer who is sealed with the Spirit of God, who is God's child, can still bring tremendous pain into that relationship. We can grieve him by our thoughts. We can grieve him by our thoughts. We grieve him in our, can grieve him with our words. We can grieve him with our actions. We can grieve him with our thoughts, impure thoughts. Jealous thoughts, envious thoughts, selfish thoughts, faithless thoughts bring, gr bring grief to the heart of God. Remember this. Where you are, he is. Where you are, he is. In other words, the Spirit of God, he hears every single word I speak. He knows every single thought I have. And when those words are impure, when those thoughts are impure, it brings grief to the heart of God. But we can also grieve the Spirit by our actions and our inactions. In other words, failing to do something we know we ought to. Ignoring his prompting to, to do what is right. Ignoring his word or, or contradicting his word to us. Bring grief to the heart of God. Brings grief into the relationship of God and his people. Beloved, it is this kind of transformational theology that when we begin to really think on these things, it is what motivates us and empowers us to live on a different plane. To live on a different plane. We are saved to the praise of the glory of his grace, right? Chapter 1, three times Paul says that. We are, we are saved to the praise of the glory of the grace of God. And how we conduct ourselves as a community of believers brings him the kind of glory and praise he rightfully deserves, or it doesn't. Or it doesn't. Again, let me stress it one more time. 
If you are a child of God this morning by the grace of God through faith in the resurrected Jesus Christ, then, then grief into the relationship does not destroy the relationship. Cannot undo what God has done. But it can damage it. It can damage it. We grieve the Spirit of God additionally when we do not repent. When we do not repent. When we know that we have sinned and we refuse to turn from that sin, we hang on to it. We nurse it. We nourish it. We play with it a while. And it is this hanging on to sin that, that brings grief into the relationship and inevitably leads to a, to a diminishment of the fellowship of that relationship. We, we begin to feel distant from God. It's not that God is distant from us. He has not left us. But we've turned our back on him. And we create space. We create distance. We create coldness in the relationship. And that grieves the heart of God and diminishes the joy that you and I should be experiencing in union with God. It can even diminish our sense of assurance. Not the reality of our assurance, but, but the sense of our assurance. The, the joy of our salvation can become cold and distant. Even leading us to wonder sometimes, am I really a child of God? Grieve not the Spirit. Grieve not the Spirit. Because we are in a loving two-way relationship with the Spirit of God, we're motivated we are motivated to love him and to experience his love in return and not to grieve him. So grieve not the Spirit of God. Beyond that, verse 31, <clears throat> enter not the vortex. Grieve not the Spirit. The second prohibition is enter not the the vortex, verse 31. What is a vortex? Well, a vortex is a, is a swirling mass of air or fluid that draws things in. It could be a tornado, for example, or it could be a whirlpool. And once one is caught in the vortex, one is drawn in deeper and deeper, and the, the power and the force of it overcomes. It makes escape very, very difficult. Verse 31, Paul is describing a, a, a very powerful vortex here, and the, and the vortex he is describing is the, is the power of sinful thoughts and words that devastate Christian relationships. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Notice how Paul begins here, let all of these things. In other words, every sort of, all kinds of, every form of, this is a universal prohibition here. There's to be no place for all of this. If we're going to avoid the, the vortex, the death trap, we have to stay away from this stuff or it will pull us in. Let all bitterness, he says, be put away from you. Bitterness. Pekria is the Greek word. It means a bitter taste. It means a, a pungent smell. It means a penetratingly sharp pain. This is how the word is used. And it metaphorically refers here to a hard-heartedness that harbors resentments from the past. This is the bitterness that Paul says we must avoid. We must avoid the, the hard-heartedness that harbors resentments from the past. How do resentments come? 
Where do they come from? How are they built? Such a powerful concept. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, the doctor as he was known, in his commentary on this part of Ephesians, addressing the question of how resentments are built, says the following. He says, by, quote, brooding upon wrongs, either real or imaginary. By brooding upon wrongs, either real or imaginary. Beloved, we live in a world of sinners, and we are sinners. And what that inevitably means, don't look at that quote. I'm not ready for it yet. You look at me. You got that? Because I don't want to get bitter here. I'm just I'm teasing you. We live in a broken world, and we are broken people. And that means that we are going to sin against each other. We are going to, to do wrong to one another. It is, it is as inevitable as the sun coming up every morning. People are going to hurt you. People are going to disappoint you. People are going to say mean things to you. People are going to fail to live up to your expectations. People are going to act towards you in a way that, that is hurtful to you. That's a reality. Beyond that, our own sinful mind can deceive us into, into thinking that someone has wronged us when they really haven't. It is these hurts, it, real and perceived as it were, that become the source of the resentments, that become the source of the, the hard-heartedness that, that hangs on and dwells on. Others' failure. Now, look at the further quote from Jones. It's insightful. He says, I grant that there may be genuine grievances. See what he says? He's not saying that, that it's not real, that the hurts aren't real, that people don't really offend us. They do. I grant that there may be genuine grievances, but what makes us bitter, look at this, what makes us bitter is that we ponder them and meditate upon them and stay with them. In other words, we nurse our grievances. We dwell on them. We pay great attention to them. And if we tend to forget them, we deliberately bring them back and allow them to work us up again into a state of bitterness. Where does bitterness come from? It comes from us focusing upon the hurts of others. Nursing them. Turning them over again and again and again in our minds. Bitterness is a poison we mix for others and consume ourselves. It is devastating, devastating to relationships. Let all bitterness be put away from you. But Paul goes on. Let all bitterness and wrath and wrath, what is wrath? Wrath is, is sort of like an explosion. It's, it's a passionate, temporary boiling up. It's a flash of emotion. It just comes, wrath. And anger, he says, verse 31. Anger is, is something different. It's more like an abiding, settled state of fury. These terms, by the way, are often used as synonyms in the New Testament. Wrath and anger, they can, they can be used back and forth. So the distinctions about the, the temporary flash and the, and the deep settled, yeah, they're there in the words, but, but we don't want to make too hard of a distinction. Here he's, he's gathering it up. He's gathering it up. These are the forms of anger. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, and he goes on and he says, and clamor and slander. 
Clamor, interesting word. Yelling would be a good translation. Shouting, screaming would be clamor. By the way, the, wor the word is um, neutral. It is morally neutral. It can be good, for example, at a sporting event. It can be, it can be clamorous, and that would be a good thing if your team's winning. Or it can be an evil thing, and in the context here, it's an evil thing. It's a yelling, shouting, screaming that is clearly negative in its context. Beyond that, he says slander. Slander. It's the idea of, of abusive or profane speech. And again, these terms are, are, are related in the context here. They, it's the yelling, the screaming, the shouting of profanity and, and abusive speech is what he's getting after here. Let all resentment and wrath and anger, and yelling, and screaming, and, and, and abusive language be put away from you. Be put away from you. It's not to be part of our life. Along with all malice. Malice. Malice is a mean-spiritedness. A viciousness, a desire to hurt someone, hurt someone. How many homes in America do you think experience these devastating storms of resentment, wrath, anger, yelling, Abusive and profane language, viciousness, far too many, far too many. It's to have no place in a Christian home. It's to have no place in a Christian church. Let all forms of this, Paul says, each and every kind be put away from us. This is the put off of the put off, put on transformation that Paul has been talking about here in this chapter. Every form of these thoughts and behaviors, beloved, they need to be put away from us. They need to be put away. And when you look at them all together, Paul seems to be describing here a vortex of evil. A vortex of evil in which the, the bitterness and the resentments can, can drag us in and down with one evil leading to the next. Resentment speaks of our attitudes. It's an attitude which then leads to a disposition. When we, when we nurse our grievances... It leads to a certain disposition, and a, and a disposition that's characterized by wrath and anger. We become an angry person. And that disposition then leads to a conduct, and the, and the, and the conduct is a, is a yelling and, and, and abusive kind of speech. And it leads to a purpose, and the purpose is to hurt someone. To hurt someone. To do ill to someone. You see why this vortex is so dangerous? And it all begins with the nursing of the resentments. You're going to be hurt. You have been hurt. You will be hurt. It's what we do with it. If we nourish it. If we dwell on it. If we won't let it go. It will drag you to destruction, to destruction. What are we to do with relational hurts? We're to acknowledge them. We're not to pretend they didn't happen. We are to acknowledge them. But then we are to move on, to move on, not to dwell on them, but instead to, to flee to the gospel. And that leads to the, 
third prohibition of this section. Forget not the gospel. Forget not the gospel, verse 32. The means by which we grieve not the spirit and enter not the vortex is to forget not the gospel. To forget not the gospel. This is the put-on side of the put-off, put-on transformation. As we grow in the gospel, as we become proficient in the gospel, as we preach the gospel to ourselves, we avoid the vortex. We escape the downward spiral of sin. Verse 32, be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Paul begins and he says to, to be kind. It's a present middle imperative. In other words, it's, a, it's the idea of an ongoing action that involves you. We could literally translate this, by the way, as become kind which I think captures that idea of an ongoing action here. We are to become kind. Become kind. In other words, we are not naturally kind. The old man is not naturally kind. We are to become kind. To become kind. It's a virtue. And it's a virtue that we have to deliberately and, and regularly cultivate in our hearts. It's not a one-time event. Notice the focus here. Be kind to one another. Do you see it? One another. In other words, he's, he's speaking here again in a community. Speaking in a community. We are to be kind to each other. Not nice. Not nice. Kind. We often confuse niceness and kindness to our own peril. You can be nice without being kind. You know, the typical nice guy. He's a nice guy. But he's not kind. He's not kind. Why? Because we have to understand what kindness is. Kindness is being useful and helpful to others being useful and, and helpful to others. It is doing good to other people. That's what it means to be kind. See, you can be nice where you don't, you don't create any ripples and you know, you're just sort of there and you go along and so forth, but that's not active, and kindness is active. Kindness is an active thing. And we don't want to settle for niceness. We want to pursue the biblical virtue of kindness. Kindness. To do people good. Kindness is an attribute of God, by the way. It is an attribute of God. For example, Luke chapter 6 and verse 35, where Jesus says, Love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself, check it out, is kind to ungrateful and evil men. God is kind to those who don't deserve it. He does good to people who do not deserve it. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Writing to the Jews there, Paul says, Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? In other words, God's kindness, his goodness, his active goodness towards the unbeliever is to draw them to repentance. It's an attribute of God, kindness. It's also a synonym for God's saving grace. It's a synonym for God's saving grace. For example, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, where Peter writes, Like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation 
if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. The kindness of the Lord. It's a synonym for God's saving grace. Here in this same, this same book, in chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, where Paul writes, Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Kindness is another way, it's a synonym to speak of God's saving grace. Kindness is a change brought about in the believer by the indwelling Spirit of God. Galatians chapter 5, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It is the fruit of the Holy Spirit of God. It's It's a transformation. Beloved, when we put on kindness, we emulate our adoptive father. We emulate our adoptive father. Become kind to one another. Next, Paul says tender-hearted. Become tender-hearted toward one another. There's a very rare word here, tender-hearted. It's it's the idea of compassion. You're looking for a a good word, compassion, is what Paul's talking about here. It's it's the idea that, that people's troubles reach deep down inside to us. We feel them. We care about them. And we desire to do something about it. We desire to help. We desire to help. I think it's, a, it's being tender-hearted that draws forth kindness. The form of the word is used, by the way, over in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 9 and verse 36. Speaking of Jesus, his compassion for the crowds, his tender-heartedness for the crowds. Seeing the people... He felt compassion for them. He was tender-hearted toward them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, their predicament, he felt. It, it impacted him deeply. Become kind to one another tender-hearted with one another, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Forgiving. Charizomai is the Greek verb that's used here. It, It literally means being gracious to one another. It's translated as forgiveness, but but it means to be gracious to one another. Be gracious to each other. And the standard here, look at it, is just as God in Christ has also been gracious with you. Just as he's been gracious with you. The measure of the forgiveness, the graciousness, and that's really the expression of graciousness, is the, is the ability and the desire to forgive. Is what God has extended to you and I. That's the standard. Paul is exhorting them and us to to extend to each other here in the body what he has extended to us individually in Christ. I mean, you can't help but think about Peter's words to Jesus, right? Matthew 18. Lord, if, if my brother sins against me, how many times do I forgive him? Up to seven times? Peter, 70 times 7. And you'll remember when we were teaching through Matthew, that he's not establishing a numerical number like uh, you get 490 but not 491. He's saying there is no limit, Peter. There is no limit. 
Because there's no limit on what God has extended you in Christ. You don't have just like a certain tally and you'll get that much and no more. This is the motivation. This is the empowerment. Beloved, I think we can safely say that forgiveness is of the essence of Christianity. It is of the essence of Christianity. What I mean by that is we can't earn it. We cannot earn forgiveness. And we can't buy it. And we can't demand it. And we don't deserve it. But we must both give it and receive it as a gift by grace through faith. And that's how Paul would have us escape the relational death spiral. It's to forgive. Forgive the hurts. Forgive the angry words. Forgive the, uh, the relational slights. Forgive the intentional sins that are inevitable in a community of believers, that are inevitable in your own homes, that are inevitable in a marriage, that are inevitable in human relationships. Forgive. Don't dwell. Forgive. How much? How far? How much and how far has God forgiven you? May his Holy Spirit empower us to fulfill his commands to us. Let's pray. God, our Father, these words with regard to relationships are so appropriate. And they are direct. And they're kind. They're not nice. They don't, they don't make us feel good. But they are kind. Because they do us good. Oh Lord, I pray this morning for those ones right now who have harbored a bitterness, a resentment in their heart towards someone. Our Father, the, the offense may be great, it may be grave, it may be horrible. And yet, oh Lord, If they do not release, if they are not willing to forgive, their lives will be drawn into the vortex of destruction. Our Father, they know who they are right now, and you know who they are. May your Holy Spirit apply the truth this morning and set them free. I ask in the name of Jesus, our conquering, resurrected Savior. Amen.